Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, June 19th, 2024. We are in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So the setup, Naaman is commander of the armies of Aram, and he's a very good general, and they've won victories, and that's gotten him political clout, he has one serious flaw. Now, the Armenians did not have the prohibition against people with leprosy being in public that the Israelites did. They did not shun them from society. You know, you were allowed to serve. Now, there was some prejudice against it, and the people wished you wouldn't be out in public, and he probably tried to hide it with his clothing, etc., and that probably limited the spread a little, but he was probably still contagious. But they didn't know that, and they didn't have God's word, and so they didn't have a public problem with him serving. And so he served as the general, and he was a good general and successful. Part of what they would do as raiding bands from the uh, when they raided enemies is they would raid and capture agricultural goods and consumer goods from the towns and cities they raided and bring them back home. But they would also capture slaves, and uh, people would get slaves and. Uh, very often they came to the households of the men that participated in the raid. So it's not real surprising to me that Naaman's wife got a slave. And she happened to get this girl from Israel. And the girl becomes concerned about her master. And her master, and her, well, her, her master is the Naaman's wife, but uh, the master's husband. And consequently, she just makes this comment, and um, maybe not more than once, that, you know, there's this prophet that could heal him because Elisha has the reputation of being able to work miracles. We have several miracles recorded in Scripture, but apparently there was more miracles than that, and he had healed people and all kinds of things that we don't have recorded in Scripture. And she knew about them, and she trusted that he could heal Naaman. And so she tells her master, the Naaman's wife, and obviously Naaman's wife tells Naaman and spreads it around and it gets to be known. Verse 4. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. <sighs> um, the king wants his servant healthy. Naaman has this problem. He's ill. Uh, it's one that has a public stigma and it's visible, but nobody can do anything about and they don't have a prohibition of you being in public with it like the Israelites do but it's still socially unacceptable 
And so the, the king of Ram would love to have his uh, general uh, healthy. I mean, it, it can't be a bad thing to be healthy, right? So, and he hears this, and so he says, Hey, I'll send you. Um, you know, at this point in time, Syria is becoming the serious local power. Uh, Assyria is beginning to arise, and the Armenians and the Israelites um, have a similar language. Uh, it was about mutually uh, understandable as Spanish and Portuguese are today, the, the two languages. So, you know, it was pretty easy to learn the other one's language. And um, they had some natural um, affinities for each other. Now, they were also natural enemies at times. Uh, but when Syria, who's between them, is on the rise and is the big regional power, you want to get allies and, um, you know, try to get some allies to help you with your fight with the big guy. And so, you know, the king of Aram goes, well, this is a good opportunity to go, you know, possibly get some good uh, relations with these guys. You know, ask for the prophet to heal him and, um, you know, will, you know, if he heals him, then, you know, we'll feel good about y'all and y'all can then understand that we feel good about you because this is my important servant. And the king of Aram uh, is serious about it. Uh, paying a prophet was generally uh, for something like this, you know, one to ten days labor uh, wages is sufficient. But he's sending a lavish gift, one that's fitting from king to king. This is about 750 pounds of gold and 150 pounds, I mean, 100, 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. And 10 changes the clothes. And the implication um, here is that this is not just, you know, common everyday clothing. This is prized clothing fitting for royalty or whatever. And so you don't send a general with that much wealth by himself. He's not walking across the country lugging, you know, having a, a camel or a donkey carry all that and carries. No, he's got a whole retinue, retinue with him. He's got soldiers and they have uh, animal keepers, and they have cooks, and they have people to take care of the animals, and they have um, tents and people to take care of that. And, you know, there may have been a thousand people in this group. And when they march into Israel, this looks like a royal delegation coming to Israel. And they have this letter it's fairly simply written and says, please cure my servant. And they assume that a prophet that powerful will be so known and so famous and so important to the kingdom that as soon as they read the letter, they'll go, oh, go see the prophet. They don't understand the prophet is opposed to the king, and the king's opposed to the prophet, and they're at odds with each other, and there is much bad will between the king and the prophet as there is between Israel and Aram. And so it sounds like they're asking the impossible of the king because they sent the wrong person. They knew it was the prophet that was going to heal, and they sent a letter to the king. Now, in their country, if somebody from Israel had come in and says, 
heal me. And they had a prophet that healed people and had a ministry of healing people. The, the, the prophet would be famous and supported by the king and part of the royal uh, court or at least nearby in, in the city. And, um, you know, if somebody came needing the prophet, the king would be like, sure, go out the front door, turn left two blocks, turn left again, and his house is on the right. You know, that, that's the way it would have been done. And yeah, I can't do it, but the prophet does, and, you know, it's a short walk, go. <laughs> you know, and when you come back, we'll visit and have a good time after you're cured. I mean, and the king of Ram cannot imagine with this letter that the king of Israel would take offense. If the prophet can do it, it's going to be simple, right? Because the king knows the prophet and, you know, that kind of person's got to be important in the kingdom. And that's not the way it is. And let's go to verse 7. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send me someone to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? I mean, the king of Israel is upset. He's thinking that the king of Aram is sending a leper to him for the king of Israel to cure him. And if that's the case, I mean, that's the kind of thing that causes wars. And that day and time, it definitely does. And, you know, he doesn't think of Elisha. Elisha is not a person that he would want to deal with. Because Elisha holds him to his sin. And the, this is one of the sons of Ahab, by the way. We don't know which one. The, the scripture doesn't record it. But the king that's in is not Ahab, but it's one of his sons. And, you know, the first son to rule was just like dad and mom. The second one to rule was more like Jeroboam son of Nebat, he just sinned by offering his sacrifices to the golden bulls instead of to Yahweh. But he called the bulls Yahweh and, you know, and, you know, God's still upset with him and he's still worshiping an idol and not God. And, you know, but He's attempting to be more righteous than his parents who are worshiping foreign gods that are false gods. So he's, well, he's worshiping a false god too, but he's worshiping a local false god, not a foreign false god. Yeah, okay. But, and Elisha is calling him to task and saying, worship Yahweh and worship in the temple in Jerusalem and obey the Mosaic law and read it and make yourself a copy and rule the country by Mosaic law and have Levitical priesthood, Aaronic priesthood, and don't just assign anybody to be a priest because they pay you a couple of days wages for the privilege and you know make sure you're obeying Yahweh and of course it's not making any difference to the king so Elisha doesn't do much with the king he's not trying to antagonize him his ministry is with common folk and getting them to worship Yahweh and worship him truly and know the law and do it and so the king is upset. Verse 8. When Elisha the man of God heard that the king 
of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the, have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. I mean, Elisha hears it, the rumor mill uh, does, and, you know, Elisha knows who he should have come to. And so he sends a messenger to the king. Hey, yeah, send him down to me. Don't worry about it. You know, I'll take care of this for you. Because Elisha knows who does miracles. God does. And it, he does it through him. And he's probably prayed about it and knows what he's going to do. And it's kind of humorous. Verse 10. Oh, no, no. Verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Uh, Elisha didn't go out to meet Naaman. He just sends a servant out with a message and says, you know, Go down to the Jordan, wash seven times, and you'll be clean. Man, yeah, you can go home, basically. It's, it's a simple thing. Um, the Jordan was not the same direction as Naaman would go to go home, so it's out of the way. But, you know, it's not that far. By chariot, um, it's probably one or two days' journey into the closest place. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not that far. You can go. And... Um, He's just sending him on his way. I've told you what to do. Verse 11. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of, his, of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Are not Abana and uh, Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. He's an arrogant man. And he's expecting a spectacle. Uh, he's expecting that prophets make a spectacle. And he is an important man. He's expecting respect and showmanship. And he's going to get the very best and I mean he's been to the Jordan and it's a muddy river and the rivers back home are clean and wouldn't it be better to wash in one of them the thing is the washing in the water is not what cures you if washing in the water cured you all the lepers from Israel and uh, the other side of the Jordan would be coming down to the waters of Jordan and washing and being cured and going back home and it would be well known and the little girl wouldn't have told her her master yeah, your husband needs to go to the prophet in Israel she would have said he needs to go down and wash in the Jordan it's not the water of the Jordan that's going to cure him it's being obedient to God that's going to cure him. And quite honestly, um, if he'd been like, I'm not getting in the Jordan, it's flowing too fast, I'm going to send a servant down to get seven pitchers of water, and I'm going to take my bath up here on the hill, God might have cured him. God might not have, because it wasn't in the Jordan. But he's upset, he's arrogant, he's uh, conceited, and he does not want to obey. It's just, it's not fitting his conception of how things should go. And so he's upset and he's angry and he's feeling hurt. Verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then, when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? 
So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Now his servants talked sense into him. Uh, you know, they're used to t uh, talking to him and convincing him of what he needs to do. That's part of their job. And they realize, hey, you know, this is simple. And they also recognize that if the Jordan was what cleaned you, everybody would be sending their lepers down to the Jordan because everybody would know it. And they wouldn't have ever gone to the prophet's house. That it's being obedient to what the prophet tells you that's going to cure you. And, you know, they're like, Master, you do great things. And if he told you something hard, like, you know, and the thing that comes to my mind is like Saul had told David, I want, you know, 200 foreskins of the Philistines, you know, or something like that. Um, you know, something that would be hard, he would have done it because it would have been prestigious. But the servant goes, then, you know, can't you just do something humble and see if it works? I mean, you know, the, the kind of the attitude the servant's going is like, can't you do the simple and the humble and, you know, see if it works? If it works, you're cured. If it doesn't, well, we haven't lost anything. And, you know, we haven't paid the guy. It's not like we've paid him all this money and maybe it doesn't work. You know, he didn't even ask for payment. Just go down and do it. You know, and Naaman here since talked and says, well, you know, my servant who I trust, uh, you know, he's got some sense there. And so he goes down to the Jordan and he doesn't take a bath like you and I would think of taking a bath. He just goes in and basically stoops into the water, dips up, comes up out of the water, and he does that seven times. And when he walks out, he's been cured. And his leprosy has been cured. Now, everybody in the Middle East knew that leprosy normally did not cure itself. And if it did, it was a slow process and it took months or years and you could be being get, you know being healed for years on the end and then something happened it grew worse and so they know just a few minutes in the river and you come out and your skin looks young is not normal. They know a miracle's happened. Verse 15. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but to the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon, to bow down and he leans on my arm and I bow down there also when I bow down in the temple of Ramon may the Lord forgive your servant for this go in peace Elisha said so when he finds out he's cured he's overjoyed he knows the miracles happened and he is convinced I'm gonna worship Yahweh only and okay he knows that the king requires him to be in worship for the God the king worships. And part of his job is to be the guy that helps the king bow down and get back up. And so the king is going to be needing his help and he's going to have to be bowing down in the temple. But 
his heart's going to be worshiping Yahweh even though he's going to be in this temple, this other God. And he has the very provincial view that gods are local. Uh, that was common in the Middle East. We've mentioned that before. And so he wants dirt from Israel so he can worship Yahweh. He just doesn't understand that Yahweh's maker of heaven and earth and you can worship him anywhere because it's all his dirt. You don't have to have dirt from Israel. Uh, you can worship him in a ram just as well on Armenian dirt because um, Armenian dirt is God's dirt too. You know, but it, it's part of how he's going to know that he's worshiping Yahweh and not something else. Is he's going to do it on Israelite soil. And so he wants two mules load worth of soil, which, you know, Elisha's like, sure, we got dirt here <laughs> to dig up two mule, you know, what two mules can carry and carry home. You can worship Yahweh. Uh, I, I'll accept that you've converted to worshiping Yahweh. And, um, okay, I'll forgive you the sin of having to bow down in the temple because you got to serve your master and you know if he tells you to be there you got to be there and I understand that and you know you're forgiven go in peace God accepts your worship because Elisha knows it's worship in truth and spirit and if this man is now converted and worshiping Yahweh it really doesn't matter whether he's worshiping on Israelite soil. It doesn't matter if he's being obedient to his master and helping his master bow down and uh, get back up. That if he's worshiping Yahweh, he's worshiping Yahweh. And that he's been converted because the miracle happened to him. And Elisha knows that's the kind of thing that gets Yahweh worship in a ram. Because this is an important man, and his servants are going to start worshiping Yahweh because he worships Yahweh. And their family and friends are going to start worshiping Yahweh. And Elisha knows that he is doing evangelism in a ram by having told Naaman to go to the Jordan, wash seven times, come back, and he's clear. And so he's like, you're fine, go. God's good with this. And so, you know, Naaman is going to load up two loads of dirt and take them to, back to Aram. Notice the prophet talks to him this time. Comes out and talks to him. It's man on man. And, you know, doesn't make a lot of demands of him. Accepts the fact he's converted and sends him on his way. He doesn't accept any pavement. He's not in the business of accepting big payments from people. He knew God's going to provide. He knew that Elijah, his master, uh, God provided for him and fed him and kept him safe and clothed. Elisha has been kept safe and clothed and fed I mean, he's healed poisonous stew. He's taken a little bit of food and fed a big crowd. He knows God can provide. He has no problem. And he doesn't need silver and gold and clothes and stuff. And so he turns the payment down and just says, go home. Yes, I'll let you worship Yahweh. You can have some dirt. We'll, we'll give you the dirt. It's God's dirt, so sure, you can have the dirt. And you can worship Yahweh and do whatever it takes for you to worship Yahweh, and God will accept it. He knows that. He's not too worried about all the details. And, okay, you have to be obedient to your master. I support that. You're forgiven. Well, it's good. Middle of verse 19. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Armenian, by not accepting from him what he brought. 
As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. So Gehazi gets greedy. And he decides, you know, master sent him away without any payment. And I'm going to come up with this story, which is a lie. And, you know, two people came in and we need to honor them. So he he's saying, hey, can you give me something to give to them? Well, Gehazi is lying. There's no, you know, two people coming in. He's wanting a talent of silver and two changes of clothes for himself. God has not told him to. God has not approved this. Elisha knows that God does not want his money or clothing. Verse 23, By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them, and then he tied up the two talents of silver and two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away, and they left. Then he went in and stood before his master Elisha. Where have you been, Gehazi? Elisha answered. Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. Once you lie, you got to make another lie to cover it. Elisha has been told by God what happened. He already knows. He's asking because he wants Gehazi to tell him the truth. Gehazi lies to him. Verse 26, But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or accept clothes, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, or manservants and maidservants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and he was leprous as white as snow. So Elisha calls him out and performs another miracle. Gehazi has Naaman's leprosy, and Elisha says all of his descendants will have leprosy forever. That's a real curse in Israelite society because now you have to be shunned from society. You have to live outside. You can't live in a dwelling. You have to live by yourself or with other people who have leprosy. You can't hold a job. You depend upon charity of people who are willing to offer you stuff without getting too close. You can't get too close to these people. So, you know, if they're going to say, hey, you, you're my dad, I, I want to feed you lunch, so I'm going to take this plate of food out to you, you have to stop so far from the leper, sit it down on the stump and say, hey, dad, I'm setting your lunch down here. Come get it for the ants, do. I'm going to go back home. And you run away, and then the leper can go get lunch and eat it and wash the dish and put it back on the stump so that tomorrow when he comes with lunch, the, they can grab the dish and take it home and wash it. <sighs> Gehiza has been cursed because he was greedy and took and Elisha knows it. So Elisha is routinely knowing things from God about what's going on. And this shows the miraculous extent that Elisha had. 
he knew what was going on. He performed the healing miracle. He didn't accept anything for it. He knows what Gehazi is doing and confronts him about it and then curses him with leprosy as an object lesson that you know, you're know you not supposed to be getting profit from these folks. And curses him and his descendants. So... What a hard lesson to learn. And the thing is, Scripture indicates that Gehazi never repented. If Gehazi had repented and says, yes, I was wrong, I'm sure God would have forgiven him. And if he'd asked Elijah, Elisha, rather, excuse me, to pray for him and heal him, God may have healed Gehazi. Changed his mind. But he has to leave Elisha's presence to never come into Elisha's presence again. And he is not repentant. And he does not ask for healing. And he does not trust God enough to beg for healing. In the presence of a miracle worker, and still not understanding God's values. It can happen to us, folks. We need to be careful we're not Gehazi, the servant of Elisha. We need to be trusting God like Elisha did. And if it's God's size, probably leave it with God. Yes, we are supposed to be responsible. And it's okay to earn our money by the work we do. I mean, I work 40 hours a week. For the city of Fort Worth is a, in the water department as a chemist in the central lab. And I earn a paycheck that way. And it pays the bills. And, you know, it allows me certain kinds of small luxuries. I'm not going to get wealthy. But I'm not asking a job to pay me the most that I could earn. There are more financially profitable chemistry jobs out there. I want one that allows me to continue to do this ministry and that kind of time. And uh, time to relax and other things and minister before God and minister to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church and the people that show up there and that need to know God. And I'm much more like Elisha. God will provide. He always has. He always, I mean, I, I say it over and over again. I've been saying it since I was about 17. I have never been hungry except by choice. Yes, I have chosen to fast at times, but I've never had to fast. Every time I fasted ever in my life, there's been food in my house. And if I had chosen, I'm going to start eating again. I could have reached over, gotten food, prepared it, and eaten. I've never been in a situation where I did not know where the next meal was coming from. I've never been in a position where I was down to one set of clothing. I've always had an abundance of clothing. You know, I don't have to wash clothes every day to have clean clothes on every day. I don't have to wash even once a week. I can wait about three to six weeks between washings and fill up a washer load with any one kind of clothing. Sort my clothing and, you know, there's a whole load of socks. There's a whole load of underwear, etc. Uh, there's like three loads of shirts. You know, I, I mean, that's just the way it is. God has always provided an abundance. Okay, but 
our society in 21st century North America, uh, I'm not real wealthy, but I own my house. I have two vehicles. I support Frankie and Nathan and Blaze, and we have five pets, and you know I can garden without having to have it make to worry about starving. Um, you know, I spent today uh, planting some seeds in the garden, uh, uh, harvested earlier in the week, and planted seeds then, and planted some more today, and. You know, next week I'll probably uh, put mulch over it after the stuff comes up and gets high enough that you can mulch around it. You know, uh, but I'm doing it more for fun and recreation. And sure, I'll be able to eat okra and green beans and enjoy marigolds that keep the pest off the green beans. And, you know, that, that it's going to be good. But, um, you know, I'm doing that because I enjoy it. Uh, that little plot that's probably about 25 by 25 is not, to feed, not going to produce enough food to live on. Uh, you know, if I wanted to produce enough green beans to feed me and my family, I'd be like, um, I need several acres and let's plant, you know, a patch of green beans and let's patch a uh, patch of okra and let's plant pe uh, peppers and peas and and you know greens and corn and tomatoes and 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 you know two to four acres and you know I'd be concerned about everything being just optimal and I'd be concerned about what's the least amount of effort I could do to get this and to harvest it and come in and I'd be out there every day. No, I mean, in the spring I planted the potatoes and I think I looked at them three times until it was the date that, it was the earliest date that um, they could be harvested and when I looked at them uh, then it wasn't ready so I waited a week and checked it again and um, it was getting close, so uh, in about four days, I checked it again. It wasn't quite ready, but it's closer. And then, you know, two weeks after when it was uh, due, I finally got out there and thought, yeah, it's just time to harvest the potatoes. And I harvested potatoes, and then, you know, since I'd planted two varieties, I harvested the rest of the potatoes when they came due, which was two, two weeks after the their due date. And, you know, I got a decent crop of potatoes, 37 pounds from 4 pounds of seed, but 37 pounds isn't going to feed my family for a year. I'm not worried about feeding the family. It, it's fun to garden. It's a hobby. And, you know, I'll get okra and we'll have all the okra we want, and I'll get green beans and we'll have all the green beans we want. But we're not worried about eating from that garden. Honestly, it may be cheaper to go down to Walmart and buy canned green beans or frozen green beans or go to Sprouts and buy fresh green beans than me garden. I'm not gardening. Well, I am gardening for the food, but I'm not gardening to feed myself. I'm gardening to have fresher beans and fresher okra and fresher potatoes and to enjoy the experience and that's because God has blessed me so much I don't have to and I know that I have enough why do I need more why do I need to worry about it why do I need to stress over it I don't and so I trust God to go on. And Elisha is the same way. And he doesn't need gold and silver and clothes. And he just doesn't. So he didn't accept him. He can do his ministry for free because God provides for him. 
I can do this ministry for free because God provides for me. Holy Father, thank you for providing for me. Thank you that I have never had to worry about where my clothes are going to come from, where my food's going to come from. I've never had to worry about was I going to lose my house? Was I not going to have somewhere to live? I mean, uh, the biggest financial worry I've ever had and you provided. I had two cars. One of them was broke down while I was working on it, trying to repair it. And then the other one broke down. And I spent my day off repairing the one that had been broke down that I was halfway through repairing. And you gave me insight and I repaired it. And so the day I had to go back to work, I had a car. I did not miss work. Because you always provided a way to get there. And when I had two cars that neither one of them were liable, there was only one day in nearly a decade where at least one of them was not working. And it was a day I could spend at home working on the vehicle and you had it repaired. So I never, ever, ever was without a vehicle when I needed. You are that kind of God. You provide. And thank you for that. I am grateful that you support your servant. Lord, I ask that you be with grace fellowship, that we will trust you the way Elisha did and know, and we will minister before you trusting that you will provide. And when you do provide, seeing it and being grateful. Lord, help us not to be greedy like Gehiza was. That, um, that we will seek our, our own profit in this life. Because profit in this life, we don't take it with us. And we leave it here. And it really doesn't matter in the long run. And Lord, I'm getting old enough that I don't need the wealth. I just need enough. And apparently you've provided more than enough for my future. And I trust you to continue to provide enough. In your holy name, amen. I'm your host, Frank Reich. Associate Pastor of Family and Ministry at Grace Fellowship Baptist Church, and this has been the Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, June 19th, 2024. This was recorded on Saturday, June 15th, 2024, and um, it's been a good and relaxing day for me. I did a walk through, well, my second uh messiest regular walking area and then my messiest extension walking area um, I'm already getting to the point where it looks like I'm going to easily finish my walking area so I was doing an extension walk and walked my messiest dirtiest extension walk that I ever walk every year and I didn't get finished with it it got too hot it was uh, I got overloaded for the third time and I had all my bags full and Frankie had come picked up litter from me twice and I was having to do it a third time and she couldn't find any more bags and I, it was 95 and I was hot and the dog was hot and I just gave up, you know, um, I've got to finish that route sometime. Um, possibly tomorrow, we'll see, uh, but uh, you know, it's just time to come home. I hadn't eaten breakfast, I'd been out about four hours, and it was just time to come back. But even that was good. I have, uh, you know, ten shopping bags of recycles on the front porch that I've got to go out here when it cools off in a few minutes and take care of. It's probably about uh, three or four recycle bins of stuff and uh, 
that route fortunately has trash cans that the city provides because a lot of it's park and I'm picking up in the park so I have no problem dumping the trash in trash cans and picking up litter as I go and getting the parks clean I enjoy that and then I got home and ate and then you know got out and planted the garden and and that was fun and um, we celebrated Father's Day uh, last night and today uh, having adult children that work weekend sometimes they just can't be with me both of them are working tomorrow that work and so the, uh, they couldn't even meet each other so we celebrated Father's Day with some of them yesterday some of them today and um, so I'll have some time tomorrow and I'll get a relaxing weekend uh, and I am looking forward to that so I'm hoping to see you tomorrow at worship at to church and I uh, I'm hoping to see you Wednesday night at the Bible study. If not, we'll see you here on YouTube. And have a blessed week.